time for Tech Talk Tuesday, number 92. Alan, Bruno, <clears throat> Ron. Hey, Ronnie. Good to see you on here, man. Got a good story to tell today. Harry, Bill. Hey, Bill to me. Justin, I got a I got a good story to tell today about Atlanta Dragway. Um, they just had their last national event. I didn't go. Um, Michael and Brent, Chuck, Ron. I um, <laughs> shovelhead power hour. Ronnie Johnson. There's another one of my old heroes. Chris, thank you all for coming on. I hope this is going to be a good show. I'm, I've got a lot of good stuff I want to talk to you about. Uh, I got some history and I got some good experience. And I'm going to tell you a quick story about Atlanta Dragway. I raced there before John Myers, the late, great John Myers. I raced there with just me and Jackie and my star racing team. And then when John Myers came along, we ran with him and uh, Angel raced with us there. Steve Johnson, Matt Smith, Chip Ellis, Fred Collis, uh, Reggie Showers. You go down the list and see, I mean, Michael Ray and Scotty Polachek and if I name everybody, I'll make a mistake and forget somebody. Johnny Johnny Balls there. Uh, I think they call him Johnny Balls now. Yeah. Uh, Scott. Brian. Daryl. Anyway, we had some good history and some good times there. But I'm going to flip the camera over to me for a minute. And I'm going to look at you while I tell you my Atlanta story. All right, let's get these names on here. Here we go. All right, uh, let's see what I got here, you guys. I just want to tell you real quick, this is, I try not to take too long, but it's a really great story that deserves to be told. And since NHRA is finished with uh, Atlanta Dragway at Commerce, Georgia, we raced uh, IDBA, NHRA, we raced uh, a drag bike, we raced... Um, Let's see, what else? Pro Star, a lot. And and the IDBA was good times there. Hey, Jim, Bob, and Chris. Hi, you guys. Ricky, Darren, how are you guys? But listen, Atlanta Dragway. I saw Darren Morgan at Atlanta Dragway. But I want to tell you back, back in uh, the early 90s when John Myers was winning races, the late, great John Myers and the late, great Dave Schultz were winning races. They were winning NHRA a lot, and we were in a heated battle. We fought for the championships. I think John Myers won in 1990 the championship, and Dave won in 91, and then John Myers won in 92, and Dave won in 93, and then John won in 94, and then Dave won in 95. And they flip-flopped and jumped back and forth over each other, winning races. Hey, Boogie Man and Dave. But the cool thing about this story was is we wanted to beat Dave really bad. We would work all day and all night. We'd spend all the money we could get because he, if we if we did a good job with our motorcycle and John did a good job on the bike, we would make it to the finals. And Dave and John won in this five or six year or seven year reign, right in this little range, maybe seven years, Dave and John, John Myers and Dave Schultz won 60 NHRA national events during this little time. And if one didn't win, the other one did. And every now and then, somebody else would come through and get one. But I want to tell you the story that's worth hearing. So uh, Dave Schultz was a little bit kind of like a Superman to me in the back of my mind because I saw him do things I just couldn't believe. And it was easy to say he was doing something maybe uh, uh, below boards or something because it just seemed impossible. But I saw him do some amazing things. And he had... A, a Suzuki and a Kawasaki and he ran against our Suzuki and we had a two valve and a four valve and we would take turns with the rules trying to bump the weight and the cubic inches to our advantage. But anyway, we were coming to this race. I don't remember if it was 91 or two or three. I don't remember going to Atlanta and Commerce Dragway. I'm, Commerce was good. I, I'm just segue just for a quick second. I want to tell you guys that we tested there a lot. We went there and tested with Warren Johnson. We went and tested with um, Gary Brown a lot. And uh, we learned a lot about pro stock stuff back then. I raced pro stock car at Commerce <laughs> in 1993. I raced in, with, it, in Commerce with uh, Gary Brown in 92 in pro stock car. And we ran motorcycles at the same time. So we had our hands full and we learned a lot and it was fun to learn. I mean, that was maximum. That was like going to 
uh, um, like going to med school for drag racing, not really medical, but I'm just saying it was intense 24 seven for us to learn. So that was our peak learning time during this era. But back to Dave Schultz, I want to tell you, um, we drove to the rig, to the track late because we, we would stay in dyno to the last minute. We had John Myers engines loaded in the truck and they were still hot. Uh, we would put them in the truck and they might be cool by the time we would get to Atlanta from South Georgia and we would pull in there and when we were driving in some crew person from another team ran over to the truck and he said guess what guess what and I said what and he said Dave Schultz fell off of his trailer yesterday he was washing his rig and he fell off and he broke both his wrist Dave Schultz broke both his wrist and my first competitor brain my first thought was oh my gosh we might be able to win my second thought was, oh, no, that's terrible. Dave's got sponsors. He's got a lot of people here. He's got a lot of fans. What's he going to do? And then my third thought was, oh, no. He, that ain't going to stop him. Y'all don't know Dave Schultz. Y'all don't know the one I know. He's somewhere right now talking to some doctor, maybe a veterinarian or something, giving him a green light or fixing him up so he can race. Because there ain't no way he's going to miss a race. So... I go and think about it. We work and work and work. And we get ready to go up for qualifying. And here comes Dave Schultz on his bike for first round of qualifying on Friday. Sure enough, he has two casts. One on each arm, one on each wrist. And he had gone to some doctor in Atlanta. This is a true story, y'all. Wait, before anybody knows better than this story that was there, like family members for Dave or somebody, I apologize, but this is my opinion of how it went. So that's my whole tech talk. Tuesday, number 92 is my opinion, and this is what I think I remember. But this is how the story goes. He shows up in the staging lanes with two casts. And I go over and look at him. I said, what the heck, Dave? And he said, oh, yeah, I just I hurt my wrist, and the guy made these braces for me to, to help me feel stronger. And I'm like rolling my eyes, and I realized then what had happened was he had broke both the wrists, and he went and paid some guy, brought his, a set of handlebars to the hospital, and he had the guy cast his hands and his wrists holding onto the handlebars. And he told NHRA that he got hurt and that this were braces just to make him stronger. <laughs> no, y'all, he had broken wrists. Anyway, so he finally got in the show, he qualified pretty good, and we got in. And sure enough, we made it to the finals. And we did a good job with our bike. We were running good, and Dave was running good. And I'm going to tell y'all something. Dave Schultz whooped us. He straight left and drove away and outrun us by two bikes. I was so disappointed. Dave Schultz is in the winter circle with Diwali and the Miss Winston, and he's got two casts on his arms. And me, I go back to the truck, and Ken Johnson and the boys are over there, and they said, we suck. I said, what? Man, we are horrible. I said, what are you talking about? He said, we can't even outrun a man with two broke arms. But anyway, Atlanta Dragway, that will always be in my mind. That will always be my memory. Uh, about the late, great Dave Schultz. He was Superman. And the last thing I'm going to tell you about Dave before we go into these camshafts I want to tell you all about. So if you're clicking on and off based on who I'm talking about, you're going to want to see this next few minutes. So stay right there. But I'm going to tell you the last thing about Dave Schultz. I don't remember exactly the year it was, but we were Team Winston, and Angel was racing for us, and Dave had cancer, and he had a really bad tumor in him. And he summoned up Superman strength and entered in a race in Houston, and out of sheer strength and superhuman strength and God's mercy, he powered past all of us, and he won and beat and won the final. He won his last race. Terminal cancer, going to die any minute. He was weak on chemotherapy. I'm going to tell you, so I don't know how he got by the rules, because if you broke your toe or you broke something in NHRA today, you can't race unless you got like some surgeon says you're safe. And now you can't even get a surgeon to tell you you'll live anymore. So Dave Schultz was Super Dave. There was a TV show about a guy named Super Dave, but that Super Dave guy was nothing like the late, great Dave Schultz. And I'll remember him forever because he was the biggest pain in my butt and the biggest thorn in my side. But he defined worthy adversary. He made us work hard, and um, good memories I always have. So that's my story for the day, and now I'm changing over to the good stuff. Thanks. Okay, Tech Talk number 92. I've got something else that's interesting I want to share with you guys. 
we have these camshafts that we've been racing in uh, NHRA. We started in 2004 racing the SNS Buell engine. It was a five and an eighth bore, um, 3 3.8, 3.78, 3.8, something stroke, real short stroke, real big bore, and turned 10,000 RPM. And the cam chest that's in it look like this. And I'm going to drop this camera down so you can see this thing. You might have to blow it up a little bit to see what I'm talking about here. But I'm going to show you this, this right here. If you don't learn about camshaft events and timing while you're doing this show right here, here's the interesting part about these cams, y'all. This was in the side of that V-twin. This is a 60-degree V-twin. Uh, it had four camshafts, and the crankshaft was below, and it would go clockwise, and then it had a big idler gear that would reverse, like a Pete Jackson gear drive for you old guys, and it would go counterclockwise, and then we had this idler gear that would go back clockwise, so it was like the crankshaft. So we had an exhaust cam for the front cylinder, an intake cam for the rear cylinder, an intake cam for the rear cylinder, and an exhaust cam for the rear cylinder. So exhaust, intake for the front cylinder, intake exhaust for the back cylinder. So these are backwards, okay? So on the way the engine worked, it had an intake valve here, an exhaust valve here, it had an intake valve here, an exhaust valve here. So what I wanted you to try and see, to grasp what we were dealing with, and this really helped me learn a lot right here because the guys at SNS came up with this, and if anybody didn't ever put their cam lobes on backwards, it was a miracle. But these lobes pressed on to these shafts, and we would move, we would press this off and move this lobe wherever we wanted it, and this lobe wherever we wanted it, and this lobe wherever we wanted it. And none of these lobes are symmetrical. This has a fast opening rate and a clo slow closing rate. Same here, same here. So these are non-symmetrical or asymmetrical cams where they would have a fast rate and a slow rate. They had different ramps opening and closing than they had all four. Now, this idler gear would turn clockwise, so therefore the rear cylinder would fire first, and since it would turn clockwise, it would make this intake cam turn counterclockwise. So this lobe's going backwards, and then it would drive the rear exhaust cam, so therefore the rear exhaust cam would turn clockwise. So once you figured all that out, then we go to the front, and since this idler gear is turning clockwise, it would take this intake cam and rotate it counterclockwise, and that intake cam would drive the exhaust cam, which would make it go clockwise. Now, remember, these lobes are pressed on. So we would order the lobes, draw everything we wanted, tell them everything we wanted. And these were, uh, I wrote it down on here. This is a 600 lobe lift, 600, 600, 600. We ran, <clears throat> on the two intakes, we ran a 2 to 1 rocker ratio, which gave us 1 inch, 200 lift. We ran a 2.1 rocker ratio on the exhaust, which gave it over one inch, 200 lift. Now, if you'll see on here, you can see where it says 302, that's 302 degrees duration at 50 thou lift, 285, 285, and 302. Now, I just wanted you to get a grasp of what we're dealing with here with rotation because when you degree cams and you're turning your engine over and you're reading a degree wheel, imagine the confusion when you're trying to press these lobes on and off. And there's not a lot of people racing out there that run these things that, I mean, I'm not going to talk about who knows what and who doesn't, but I'm going to tell you something. This is an amazing combination of parts that would turn, this engine would turn 10,000, it still runs today. This engine package still runs today. 10,000 RPM, 10,500 RPM with these big lobes, and they open and close. On this side here has open and close. This side here has close and open. This side here has open and close. This side has close and open. So you have to have all that figured out when you're doing your open and closing. Now, I also did this little drawing off of a photograph of that. And I don't know if you can see this good. Somebody give me, can you hear me okay? Somebody give me a shout out on the sound because this is getting ready to get interesting. You're right, Darren. Especially when you think you know what lobe separation is. 
lobe separation. This thing right here never even knew what lobe separation was. Matter of fact, it don't even know what lobe center is. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we figured it out. Okay, y'all can hear okay, Riddell? Loud and clear. Thank you, Jerry. All right, I'm going to proceed. I'm going to start with the one that fires first, the intake on the rear cylinder, all right? I think I've got this figured out right, that if the, let's see, the intake valve opening on the, on the rear intake was at 26.5 degrees before top dead center, and the intake valve closing was 30 degrees after bottom. So figuring up the duration, I mean, the, the 50 thou open and the 50 thou close plus 180 degrees divided by two gives me 116 degrees duration. 116 degrees lobe center, not duration. Let me say it right. Lobe separation. Nope, lobe center. Let me tell you something. These right here, these guys don't know about lobe separation. These guys don't know about lobe separation. So if this is lobe separation between these lobes and there's a lobe separation between these lobes, is there also a lobe separation between this cylinder and this cylinder? You talking about messing your head. And, and, and yeah, after we'd press them on, they were so tight that they couldn't turn or you'd spot weld them. That's a great question right there. So I just want to tell you guys, now I'm going to step up this, this, this a little bit and show you a little bit better picture. I don't know if I can get all this in one frame, but I'm going to try. I did spread it out a little too much. Oh yeah, I can get it in there. Here we go. Okay. Intake valve opens 26. Intake valve closes 30. That gave us 116 lobes center. The rear exhaust intake valve opens at 94 before bottom. The exhaust valve closes at 28 after top. And that gave us a 123 lobe center. Now the lobe separation, which is people say they buy cams based on lobe separation and they buy cams based on duration. I'm going to say no. That's not what really happens. If you do all this math and do all this measuring, the lobe separation number <laughs> are the results of all this, not the reason. They are the results. So let me do the math. 123 on the rear, 116 on the front. That gives me 119.5 as a lobe separation. That's the results of the opening and closing of the intake, the opening and closing of the exhaust, giving us the lobe centers. And then add those two together, divided by two, gives you lobe separation. Now look at the front cylinder. I'll move this over just a little bit. Intake valve opens at 27 before top. Intake valve closes at 78 after bottom. That gives me a 115 lobe center. And then the exhaust opens at 93 degrees before bottom, and the exhaust valve closes at 29 after top, and that gave me a lobe center of 122. So the lobe separation on the front cylinder is 118.5. So does that mean if the lobe separation of the, of the intake and exhaust and the lobe separation of the intake and exhaust, does that mean the lobe separation of the lobe separation? What does that give you? 119. So the lobe separation of the lobe separation is 119. How's that for confusing? The coolest part about all this is, is the son of a gun actually runs. It runs, and it runs good. Now, this is not the cam we ended up with when we finished racing our NHRA career. This is something sort of in the middle when we started, when I started having an idea of what was going on, and we started moving these events. Matter of fact, these... These, uh, this overlap. Let me show you what overlap is. Can you see my AARP calculator? I got a friend that was using a calculator online last night, and he needs an AARP calculator. It's got big buttons, it's got big numbers, and he had one about this big, and he was trying to hit it, and his finger was bigger than the buttons. That's a tip for you there, my friend. 
All right. Let's figure out overlap. Exhaust valve closes at 28. Intake valve opens at 26.5. 28 plus 26. 54 degrees overlap. That's not much overlap, but when we finished, we had a lot less than that. I'll tell you another story about that in just one quick second. Let's do the overlap on the front cylinder. 27 plus 29. 27 plus 29 equals 56. So we have 56 degrees overlap on the front cylinder. Now, any of you guys that are disappointed in a really good effort where you have different lobe uh, centers, 122, 115, 116, 123, and you have a 118 lobe separation and a 119 lobe separation. If any of you guys are disappointed and all these numbers are not dead nuts the same, I'm going to ask you which one of these is correct and which one is wrong. That's right. There ain't even anybody on here watching that can tell you that. There's nobody watching. There ain't even anybody who makes camera shows that can tell you if these numbers are right or wrong. Because we try to tell the engine all the time what we want it to do. And the engine is steady trying to tell us what it wants. And as long as we're tr steady trying to tell the engine what we want it to do, we're not going to do the best we can. We need to listen to what the engine's telling us with a lot of data. And we need to make the changes to suit. And all of a sudden, we're going to run better. I'm not going to tell you that 123 was wrong or 116 was wrong or 115 was wrong or 122 was wrong. I'm going to tell you something. Disqualified number one, we ran on the pole, we set some track records with it, and it was really fast. If I was to go out there today, this would be in the 270s, maybe 260s in here, and this might still be around 302, something like that, and those lobe separation numbers and lobe centers would look really different, and these and this overlap would be less, and the intake valve closing of 30 runs my valve, that big old valve, all into the piston because it's got too much TDC lift. So we would fix that. And you're right about that, Scott. Listen to me. Which one of these cylinders needs these cams? Does it need to be this way or this way? I mean, we don't know. It took a lot of time to figure out where we are right here, but that was part of learning is trying to find the sweet spot what the engine is asking for. I know those are a lot of numbers for you guys that aren't into camshafts, but I want you to see that you don't buy a camshaft based on a lobe center. You don't buy a cam based on lobe separation. This, this number here, 116, watch this. 26 opening plus. That is so wrong. Let's say 77. Wow, that just jumped out at me. Thank you all. Let's start over. 26 plus 77 close. It's 103 plus 180 equals 283 divided by 2 equals eh, 114, 142. Intake valve closes at 78. But I'm going to show you that the lobe center is a result of the events. 26 plus 78 plus 180 equals 284 degrees. So that's duration based on the opening and closing, not opening and closing based on duration. 284 divided by 2, that's the duration. 284 divided by 2 equals 142 minus the opening of 26 equals, my calculator is so arguing with me. I was making fun of your calculator and look at me. <clears throat> 26O plus 78O plus 180 equals 1058. Equals. 
What am I doing wrong? <laughs> 26.5 plus 78 closing plus 180. 284.5. Thank you. Divided by 2 equals 142.25 minus the opening minus 26.5. 115.75, that took me a minute, didn't it? But that's how you get the lobe center. And once you do the opening and the closing, plus 180, divided by two, minus the opening, you'll get the lobe center. And then once you get the lobe center on the exhaust side also, then you can add these two together and divide them by two and get the lobe separation. Sorry, it's confusing, I am so sorry. Let's move on to something easier about cam timing and the results of it. I found this dyno sheet from last year that we did, and I'm gonna move this down to it so you can see it. This is on a 124. Oh, it's a twin cam. And I wanna show you what we did. And this is, this is a really, really poor copy. Yeah, my calculator don't like me. I'll do better next time. But you know, doing it live, it was definitely not a production item. It was live and I flopped around like a fish out of water. But this little blue dot line, this was a 124 we built with a set of stock 110 heads and it made 120 horsepower and 125 foot-pounds of torque with stock Screaming Eagle 110 heads. Then we ported and polished the heads and put the next size put the next size bigger valves in like we do our thrashers. The only change, same cam, same intake, same 58 throttle body, same D&D uh, &D pipe, everything was the same, same injectors. Only thing we did was pull the heads off, pour and polish them, put the big valves in, put them back together, put the compression ratio back the same. 145 horsepower and 139 foot pounds. So we picked up 14 foot pounds of torque and we picked up, what is that, 25 horsepower by porting the heads. Now, my point that I want to tell you guys this is everybody that I read on the internet, they say, if you port your heads and you put big valves in, you're going to lose all your torque. You're going to lose all your low end. But look, guys, the ported heads made more power everywhere. Right here, it made 10 more foot-pounds at 3,000 RPM, and it made 15 more foot-pounds at 4,000 RPM. And at peak, it made, what's that, 10, 35, 14, 14 more foot-pounds of torque at peak torque gain. And the horsepower is an OMG show. Went from 120 horsepower to 145 with only ported heads. So I just want to share you all that this is the same cam, and that's ported heads. So don't let, oh, carburetors, yeah, maybe it's a different story. Back in the day when they had carburetors, you could put a big valve, big ports, and you could lose low end power because you would lose the signal to the carburetor. Today, we got 40, 50 pounds going in the injector, and the air moving slow at low speeds doesn't matter because we can trap it with the correct cam timing and with the correct fuel injection. Anyway, I see I'm out of time. I rammed a lot through here really quick, and um, I'm sorry to, I got confused. I'll do better with that camshaft deal next time. If you watch it again in slow motion, <laughs> maybe it won't be as confusing. Thank you all very much. May God bless you all. Um, tell NHRA it was great to be able to run it. Oh, NHRA, that Atlanta Dragway, they had um, a big housing development swarming in on them and squeezing in on them, and they had to sell the land. Um, if they had kept it, they would have had angry neighbors forever, and that's what's happening to drag strips. But that's all of my story tonight. Tech Talk number 92 is in the books. May God bless y'all. Have a great night.